memories like the corners of my mind misty watercolored memories of the way we were can it be that it was all so simple then or has time rewritten every line if we had the chance to do it all again tell me would we could we david yasko westbury church christ channeling my inner barbara streisand we're in a study on miracles and we're going to talk about memories tonight and we're going to see some pretty nifty miracles take place as we talk about this we're going to start in john uh, the 21st chapter verses 1 through 14. afterward jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of tiberias it happened this way simon peter thomas called didymus nathaniel from cana in galilee uh, the sons of zebedee and two other disciples were together i'm going out to fish simon peter told them and they said we'll go with you so they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus, and he called out to them, Friends, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, Though you're not on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved all right, that was John doing a little kissing up there, okay? Uh, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153 large fish to be exact. See, Peter was a preacher. Now, he knew how to make a count. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. So Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to him, and they did the same with the fish. Now, this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. You know, one of the things I noticed um, when I was growing up, I love to talk to older people, um, is their ability to recall a whole lot from their formative years. I'm talking about memories that are clear as a bell. Because, and some of the things that I seem to be able to recall the clearest, uh, according to my mother and my sister, never actually happened. And yet I can see them as plain as day, but I'm the only one that can see them. A man wants to find memory as the diary that chronicles things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. Now, if you want to get deep into Peter's mind, spend some time reading his letters at the end of the New Testament. Because in those letters, he stirs up and his readers up with memories so they wouldn't forget what he and the other apostles had taught them and what they'd all seen together. And he wrote, I think it is right to refresh your memory, and I will make every effort to see after my departure, you will always be able, be able to remember these things. See, I've got a vivid imagination, but in, and in my mind's eye, I can see Peter thinking about the road to recovery after he denied the Lord. Remember, then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and was distraught. Have you ever noticed how memories and conscience always seem to manage to work well together? Now, the experience that got Peter's memory really juiced up is the one John recorded as the addendum to his gospel because Peter is mentioned at least 13 times in there. And so the focus is on Peter and Jesus. And I believe John wrote this section for a couple of reasons. Number one, to explain how Peter was rehired and restored to fellowship and discipleship. And number two, to put an end to the rumor that John was going to live till the second coming of Christ. You see, rumors are fascinating 
and that people can take the simplest of phrases and twist them around to make them appear harmful or threatening. I mean, people can take words and make them say what they were never intended to say. So let's consider Peter's meeting with the now resurrected Jesus, and let's consider the miracles that happened and how all of this caused Peter to remember his past and prepare for his future. Number one, Peter remembered his call to discipleship. Afterward, Jesus appeared again, by, uh, again to his disciples. By the Sea of Tiberias, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said to him, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, though you're not on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 miles, 100 miles, 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring me some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153 to be exact. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Let's go back to the upper room when Jesus was talking to the disciples before he was betrayed. Matthew chapter 26, is where we know, verse 32. Jesus says, but after I have risen... I will go ahead of you into Galilee. On the resurrection day, both Jesus and the angel at the tomb repeated the fact that Jesus was headed to Galilee. So the disciples, along with Peter, who had special instructions to be there, headed on up to Galilee. They didn't know what else to do. Well, that's not true. They ended up in Galilee because Peter knew how to fish. See, in his mind, this religion thing didn't work out. So when you leave Jesus, you go back to what you were before Jesus. And Peter was a fisherman. He knew how to fish. So he said, look, I don't, I don't know a whole lot, but I know how to fish. I'm going to fish. And they went out in the boat to the Sea of Tiberias, which is also called the Sea of Galilee. And it makes some sense because waiting is a whole lot, a whole lot more difficult than doing something, especially when you were as impatient and as impulsive as Peter was. And that night... They caught nothing. And that's sad. Here's Peter, already feeling that he failed at Christianity, and he failed the character test and denied Jesus Christ, and decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to do the only thing I know. I'm going to go fishing. And all night long they went fishing, and they caught no fish. Now, it was at that point that something interesting happened, because it was almost a digital copy of something that had happened before. You see, once before, Peter had fished all night long, and it had come up empty, and while he followed the Lord's instructions, the nets got so full of fish that the boat started sinking. So we have the same scenario here, only a firing and a few years on, and one more time, Peter followed Jesus' words and put down the nets, and one more time, those nets came up full. And while it is the same storyline, there are so many differences in the first miracle, the nets started to break. In this one, the nets hold firm. The first time, they had no idea how many fish they'd caught. But the second time, since they were all preachers now, they knew exactly how many fish were in the net. The first time, Peter had to call for help from the shore. This time, Peter was able to pull the net ashore by himself. You see, only the thought in Peter's mind was the same as when the first miracle happened. You find that thought in John 15:5 where Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's pretty neat when you think about it. Because all night long, they were prevented from catching fish. And then they catch 153 big ends just by changing sides of the boat. When I was about 11 or 12, I can remember this. Memory is an interesting thing. One of the deacons at the, at the congregation we attended, this was before my father became a preacher, 
this is when he was a, a, a mechanical engineer. And uh, but but one of the mem one of the deacons in the congregation, a fellow named Larry Martin, was a game warden, and he said to my father, "I'd like to take you guys out fishing, uh, because I know where there are good fish." Uh, and so uh, and so he had a boat and took us out, and we sat in the boat, and he said to us, "Now, do you want to catch little fish or big fish?" And I wanted to start out with a little fish, and so we caught little fish. And so we headed out to this part of the uh, of the lake, and man, it was full of little fish. We caught them all day. And my father said, after a little while, I'd like to go see some big fish. So and I remember this. He got out of the boat, and he pushed the boat. Actually, he pulled the boat behind him because where he was going to go, um, there wasn't enough room to be able to row the boat through there. It was really a little thin passage. And it opened up into a big lake where we caught big fish. And uh, and I will remember that. And, and, and so here they are. They catch 153 big ends just by changing sides of the boat. You know, sometimes the difference between success and failure is the width of a ship. So we had six of the disciples that towed the net toward shore. And then Peter had the strength to finish the job by himself. The net was full. But it didn't break, and once they got to shore, there was a fire of coals with a meal already on it. Ah, that's a pretty doggone good way to start the day, wouldn't you think about that? So from the time Peter answered the call of Jesus to this moment, Peter had denied both the Lord and his calling, but now Peter experienced the grace of the Lord Jesus because Jesus, even though he was entitled to, refused to lay down any conditions for the blessing. He didn't promise him a miracle if Peter would just confess his sins first. Jesus simply met the need and healed the wounds. Peter, for his part, was ready to get on with the business uh, of, uh, of, of fishing. And, uh, and, and, and Jesus changed his mind. He got on, and, and so Peter, for his part, then got on with the business of being a disciple. He wanted his calling back. He wanted to continue to follow Jesus, and that is just what Peter invited him to do. Now, let's look at the second point in this, and that is Peter remembered his confession of Christ. John chapter 21, 9, and 12, and 14. So, so they all gathered around for some breakfast, and you'll never guess what's on the, menu, uh, on the menu, bread and fish. Wasn't there another miracle that had that on the menu and there's something else. If you read John's gospel, you'll find out there was a sequel to that miracle. Because the next day, Jesus met a part of that crowd at the church building in Capernaum and gave them a sermon on the bread of life. And since they were Jews, they knew all about God providing the children of Israel bread in the form of manna. And Jesus was trying to tell him he was God's manna, but they didn't get it. They overlooked the fact that the bread of life was right there with them now, and it's not a difficult sermon to follow. Through Moses, God gave Israel manna, but the Father sent his Son to be the bread of life. The manna sustained their physical lives. The manna of Jesus gives eternal life. The manna in the wilderness was only given to the people of Israel, but Jesus was sent to give life to the world. You had to eat the manna to get any good out of it. And it's the same with Jesus. You have to receive him in to your very being or he can't help you. Now, when Jesus told these people this, like I said, they misunderstood him. They thought he was telling them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they left because they had seen that movie about the rugby players whose plane crashed in the mountains and they had to eat the ones who died to stay alive and they didn't, do, they didn't want anything to do with that. Besides, it was against Jewish law to eat or drink anything that is or was human and their blindness ended up costing them their souls. Now, when I said they left, I mean they took off. You know, the place emptied out like, like the last five minutes of a, uh, of a Texans game the last couple of years to the point where it discouraged Jesus. And he asked the disciples after everybody else had taken a hike, don't you want to leave too? And Peter said, no, we don't. You see, because you, you've got the words of eternal life. What we believe that you are the Holy One, you are the one, you're the only one. And the memory of that confession 
had to make the memory of the denial that Peter had done much more painful. But that confession had been authentic, so Peter's fall did not destroy Peter's faith. He still belonged to Jesus, and Jesus still belonged to him. My time is up. We will. F I have no idea why that thumb just came up there, but I'm going to keep it. Uh, I know it's not somebody listening in because it's not been published yet. Uh, and so, uh, so we'll end that right there. Let's pray. Our God, uh, thank you for the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. Father, thank you for blessing the mission trip to Guyana, Father, that, that, um, Father, that people that are truly sick may be truly healed as Dr. Brett Weathers works with them. And Father, please be with me as one of my jobs will be to give them spiritual medicine, Father, so that their souls may be well. And Father, I'm asking that we have a lot of increase in there. Father, I'm asking that many are baptized and, and help grow that congregation there at Clay Brook Road and Clay Brick Road in Georgetown, Guyana. Father, um, I want to thank you for Steve Holly and Carol Booker and, and Josh Hatfield and the kids that are going to all these conferences and vacation Bible schools and camps. And, and Father, I, I thank you for those and the people that are willing to help them. Father, we are so grateful for you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey, we'll see you guys next week.